Uh, good morning, Mary. We have two Marys with us this morning. Today's talk is on the uh, Saraputta Sutta, um, and it's it's one of these series of uh, talks on jhana that we're going through leading up to our summer study of the three marks of existence. Um, let me just read the introduction and get right to it. Saraputta, along with Moggallana, who were the Buddha's two chief disciples, and this is right from the beginning. Um, they came, they came in to the Buddha Sangha very early uh, in that, in the Buddha's teaching career and very quickly established themselves as very important figures. They understood. <coughs> in the Saraputta Sutta, Saraputta is questioned by Ananda, the Buddha's cousin and chief attendant. Ananda is confused about a fundamental aspect of the Dhamma. Ananda's confusion is common and shows the importance of relying on those that have had the direct experience of developing the authentic Dhamma to very subtle and profound levels of understanding. You know, this kind of relates to the Kalama Sutta too. If we have questions about anything, a particular subject, it's best to find someone who knows something about that particular subject. And in order to know something about a particular subject, you actually have to study that particular subject. The reason why that's significant is many, many people have um, a fabricated understanding of what Buddhism is and where it comes from, where it's going. And so depending on the source, the source you go to will, will result in the answer you achieve. So that's what the Buddha is pointing out here and what this is, the sutta is about. This is how the Buddha and those who awaken through his teachings taught others. Ananda's confusion arising from not yet having developed profound right view and not knowing <clears throat> one's right relation to reality will be experienced once all wrong views, views ignorance of four noble, ignorance, ignorant of four noble truths are abandoned. Fundamentally, Ananda's question is, how can one perceive, be sensitive to what is occurring once all wrong views are abandoned? Do you see the eye making in that, in that question? What, and this is a common thing that comes up here often. In fact, it's, it's usually an initial reaction to the Buddha's Dhamma once the implications and ramifications of what he's teaching uh, are realized. What's gonna happen to me once I let go of all self-referential views? But remember, those self-referential views are rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. So the only thing that will happen is the abandonment of ignorance and the stress and suffering and confusion that follows from that. But because we think that this fabricated self is all of me, we can't imagine living without those fabricated views and the motivation to continue to fabricate views. I know that's a lot to see in that one question, but that's where that's coming from. How can I change my views from fabricated to non-fabricated, but still maintain my fabricated views? <laughs> It's that same feedback loop that the Buddha described in his breakthrough of understanding, isn't it? And we tenaciously cling to those fabricated views. Ananda is trying to figure out a way, even though his cousin is the awakened one. In his mind, he does not realize he's doing this. None of us realize it, but he's trying to figure out a way still to maintain these fabricated views while being a part of the Buddhist Dhamma. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. And we all do that in the beginning of Dhamma Prow. I did it. Everyone does it. We can't help it. That's the nature of conditioned thinking. We want to maintain our fabricated views while we're engaging in a Dhamma practice that is designed specifically to recognize and abandon those fabrications. There's the tension. There's the difficulty. There's the reason why we might abandon Dhamma practice because we're not willing to let go of wrong views. That's how strong they are. I mean, and, and that's the certain um, parts of our views. We, we understand that they're they're not working because you know that that's our that there's our confusion to, to that's the reason we we see this is because we are confused so we're looking for something that that gives us less confusion but we're not willing to go the whole way like, that's right the whole thing out. It, it's it's like addressing the the arising of something that is stressful and eliminating just that through maybe through addiction is just a good example but any type of compulsive or clinging behavior is the same thing. And so those of us that are lucky enough 
fortunate enough to overcome addiction have put that one specific thing aside, but our minds are still rooted in ignorance because we haven't addressed the underlying manifestation. And that, again, I'm using an extreme example, but any stress and suffering, according to the Dhamma, is related to ignorance of Four Noble Truths. So anytime we hold on to that ignorance, we're holding on to, the Buddha uses a term we've joined with or we're clinging to suffering, no matter what, because it's who we are. And, and that, that's reasonable to, to think that way too, isn't it? Because I believe this is all I am, how can I let go of it? The Buddha provided this wonderful framework called the Eightfold Path to do just that. Let me go back to that one question, I'll continue. Not this question is how can one perceive, be sensitive to, uh, to what is occurring once all wrong views are abandoned. Where will you find a footing in reality? Again, that same thing. What's going to happen to me? I won't be here anymore. Saraputta's answer shows that once ignorance is recognized and abandoned, one knows that ignorance has been abandoned and remains sensitive to reality and at peace with life as life occurs. And now sensitive doesn't mean overly sensitive and it's simply, and it doesn't mean grasping in the framework of the Dhamma. It simply means we are sensitive to what's occurring, and that's the essence of the Dhamma, isn't it? Mindfulness of what's occurring moment by moment without the need for it to be any different. <clears throat> that's true and real sensitivity, isn't it? In fact, you could say that any a fabricated type of sensitivity isn't sensitive at all to what's occurring, isn't it? Because it's, it's fabricated. It's rooted in, in ignorance. It's, it's yeah. a, and so I can, be, I can be sensitive to a drink. But because my mind is rooted in ignorance and I have other issues, I can't stop. I might be sensitive to the wonderful taste of chocolate cake, but because I've lost control of my mind, I'll eat a whole cake rather than one piece. And any, you know, it go on and on and on. We do that with our thoughts too. In fact, that's really much more devastating. Uh, let me just explain that a little further. Sensitive here means con contacting phenomena through the sixth sense base. A mind rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths is a mind distracted by its own fabricated views and, and interests. <clears throat> uh, sensory contact from fabricated view, ignorant of Four Noble Truths. This is the sutta, the Saraputta Sutta. On one occasion, Venerable Ananda visit, visited Venerable Saraputta. They exchanged courteous greetings and Ananda took a seat next to his friend. Ananda asked the question, dear friend, could one develop concentration to the point that they would not be sensitive to the perception of the earth or the elements of the earth? Could one develop concentration to the point that they would not be sensitive to the infinitude of space or of consciousness? Could one develop concentration to the point that they would not be sensitive to nothingness or of neither perception nor non-perception? These are all um, non-physical realms, these different, you know, nothingness and infinite consciousness that were common teachings during the Buddha's time, and he only addressed them, not to give them validity, validity, validity but because they were, they were parts of the, um, the fabricated views of his Sangha and other people, just as common today. Just because we're, we're calling them nothingness and infinite consciousness and infinite space and this and that, all that they're describing are imaginary fabricated mental establishments that that were taught then and now that it's skillful to try to establish ourselves in these these planes of fabricated existence it's just a continuation of ignorance isn't it no matter how grandiose we might describe the estab the self-establishment it's still a fabricated view and so even during the buddhist time when he studied with the teachers that he studied with particularly olara kalama and udeka ramaputta and today, most of these spiritual practices are geared towards escape from a human life, from who we are. They're, they're taught specifically to mentally escape what's occurring. It's, in, it's, a, it's a dhamma of increased mindlessness rather than mindfulness, isn't it, that, in that way? Everybody sees that? And again, this, I'm not condemning any other practices. This, this is simply the difference between what the Buddha taught. We, anybody can engage in another practice. If you find it useful to establish yourself in the realm of nothingness and you find peace and common understanding, great, go do it. Really, I, I'm, I'm serious about that. It's simply not what the Buddha taught. And I've tried that and it didn't work. 
I, I once had a, got a call, I think I've mentioned this a few times here. I know I have. And this is going back maybe three years now, maybe even more than that. Um, I got a call from a guy who lived down in Newtown. He never ever came up to class, even though he said he did. And he said, I could immediately hear the, like almost the panic, the stress in his voice. And he says, listen, I've been a, a, a meditator for, I think he said 20 years. I don't remember the exact, something like that. And he said, I'm 38 years old. I got a great job, a great family. I'm living in Newtown. I got a house and you know, three cars. I got everything anybody could ever want. And he said, and I feel like I got nothing in my life. He said, what's the matter? And I says, well, describe your meditation method. He says, well, I've been practicing Zen meditation already I knew. And again, I'm not putting down Zen meditation. He says, and so I begin my meditation and I, I become mindful of the breath and I focus on nothingness. And I said, say that again. He says, well, I do it and I focus on nothingness. And over the phone, I could hear the light bulb going off in his head. <laughs> what you focus on is what you're going to get. And if you focus on nothingness long enough and hard enough, that's what you're going to think you've established, nothing. And there'll be no way to appreciate your moment by moment life, whether you're living the so-called American dream in Newtown or anything else. It's just not possible. He said he was going to come to class. He never did, but I wish. <laughs> but that's, that's what occurs. What we focus on expands. The Buddha taught a meditation practice is for developing jhana. Go do jhana. And there's going to be some news about that coming up too. <laughs> Ananda asked a question. Dear friend, can, can one develop concentration to the point that they would not be sens sensitive to the perception of the earth or the elements, et cetera, et cetera? Could one develop concentration to the point that they would not be sensitive to this world or the next world? Uh, and Ananda still thinks that there's some value in imaginary, establishing himself in imaginary speculative non-physical planes. Would this one still be sensitive to what is occurring? And it's because he's learned this over the years. And he's clinging to the idea that my spiritual practice is about establishing myself somewhere in the future in some more favorable plane of existence. That's all an aversion to life, isn't it? Greed, aversion, and deluded thinking. It's all included in that. And it's all expressed in that desire for, for a non-physical establishment. Saraputta answers. Yes, dear friend, even with great concentration, this one could be sensitive to what is occurring. That's the whole answer. With great concentration, you will now be sensitive to what is occurring rather than what's not occurring and always <clears throat> grasping after that. Ananda says, please explain how one could develop concentration so that they would not be sensitive to earth or to this world or the next world and still be sensitive to what's occurring. Really, you could say using the word sensitive as Ananda's using it, excuse me, would be the same as saying, could one develop concentration so they would not be clinging to earth or to this world or to the next world and still be sensitive to what is occurring. Staraputza says, let me explain. On one occasion, I was here in Savati at the blind man's grove. I developed concentration to the point that I was neither sensitive to the earth, meaning clinging, or to this world or the next world, and yet I continued to be sensitive to what is occurring. Please tell me, dear friend Saraputta, what were you sensitive of at that time? Sensitive to what is occurring, my life as my life is, as my life is unfolding. Ananda, I was sensitive to the cessation of becoming further ignorant of four noble truths. I was sensitive, meaning fully mindful, that I have come to the cessation of ignorance of four noble truths. You know it. I was sensitive to the unbinding from views ignorant of four noble truths. I was sensitive of the arising and passing away of all phenomena. Notice Saraputta is not placing any value or even credence to these dimensions of nothingness or perception, et cetera, et cetera. They're simply unimportant. There's a little bit deeper explanation of that, but the direct answer is they're no important than anything else that you might find distracting because that's all they are. They're just distractions. Just as a wood fire's flames arise and pass away, I was sensitive of unbinding from wrong views. I, I was thinking about another sutta. Let me read this again. I was sensitive to one, let me read the whole thing. Ananda, I was sensitive to the cessation of becoming further ignorant of four noble truths. Sensitive to it. We're mind, this is where we're applying our directed thought in this case, our mm -hmm. mindfulness. 
being mindful of the cessation of ignorance. It's our motivating factor. It's it what, it what gives us direction. And the Buddha doesn't teach a generalized, broad application of mindfulness, does he? He teaches it to be mindful of each factor of the Eightfold Path. I was sensitive to the unbinding from views ignorant of Four Noble Truths. I was sensitive of the arising and passing away of all phenomena. Lorna, I always had. I always think about Lorna when she says that 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 great description that your 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 thoughts are here, your breath is up here, and you're simply mindful of the arising and the passing away. It's just what's occurring, and that's what our thoughts do, don't they? They arise and they pass away. Pass away. They're constantly flowing. It's when we are so attached to our thoughts that we are distracted by our thoughts. The arising and the, that's the essence of concentration. It's the essence of jhana. I was sensitive to the arising and passing away of all phenomena. Just as a wood fire's flames arise and pass away, I was sensitive of unbinding from all wrong views. That's the end of the sutta. What a remarkable little sutta, isn't it? It's very clear direction on why we meditate, why we do all of this. Mm -hmm. um, let me go to the Marys first. Mm -hmm. Mary A was here first. Mary A. <laughs> Sorry, Mary A. Mary A, how are you this morning? I'm good. And don't forget, I grew up as a W, so I'm happy to go first. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, even though I heard this on Tuesday, I've heard it differently today. Um, so the insight of recognizing certain behaviors that you may know are just your whether it's your comfort level or but you know they're not exactly on the path are you clinging to your fabrications yes um even though you're participating in a practice um i'm just sharing that awareness that's a little bit of a okay i see that i see that in myself um and so i need to come back to the eightfold path and um, continue deepening my concentration. So I will do that. <laughs> right, right. That's, that's not a little thing, Mary. That's a big thing. You know, it that's, is. That's the Dhamma at the point of contact. It's wonderful. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Mary S., yes, how are you this morning? That looks, I, now I know why you stay home. That looks like a really comfortable chair. Yes, I call it the cruel chair. And <laughs> it's, 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 it's wool cruel work, so if you're sitting in it in shorts or without a shirt on, it is really cruel. I started out life as a Mary A. I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, the Suda is just so clear when you're listening to it. And as far as, especially for me, as far as thoughts go and, and realizing that when I'm having thoughts that are unpleasant, that I, I, I tend to cling to them and I need to just, it's just a thought, it will go. Yeah. And, and that way, yeah. I mean, it ratchets down, that would ratchet down the anxiety to nothing. Um, and it's, I mean, it's very important. I've read it and I will read the Suda again because there's a lot in there. Yeah, there is. Yeah, I'm glad you joined us this morning. Thanks for your insight. Um, we might as well keep it with the ladies first theme. Eva, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, it's interesting how very simple it all sounds and then when you try to apply it and um, I feel always amazed that just when I think I'm close on something, it opens up to a whole nother level of, wow, I'm still clinging to this, even though I have been attentive to it and I've been doing different things and I've gotten past this point, there's still all that that still <laughs> needs to be done because yeah. I, I've got an ego as we all do that um you know has gotten me to here has gotten yeah. me to now and so to unravel that is very uh sometimes halting you know because it's like do i how much further do i have to keep going mm -hmm. um, and, um, but uh, it is important to continue through and uh and when you get past that point you see how much really was there and now is no longer there and how much better it is am i making any sense no, oh yeah no. but anyway all right that's mm. it <laughs> well, it made perfect sense thank you Eva. you're you're describing the common problem aren't you um it's why um 
because shanti, perseverance, and joyful enthusiasm are part of the seven factors of awakening. We have to, we have to continue, and hopefully in a joyful way, because we understand where we're going. But as real as it seems, like there's endless layers to the onion, every layer is just a fabrication. There, and as, as the Buddha teaches, and as we know, there's really nothing, no substance to them, except, and it's a good thing to understand, except to the level of our clinging. So these things that we really, that we see like levels, we should really see them as clinging to those specific views. That's all. And as we let go of the views, we keep peeling off the layer. But it's, a, it's an apt metaphor for what we're doing too. But we don't, I had this question from an online student just about two weeks ago. He says, do you mean I have to, I have to recognize and abandon every fabricated thought I ever had? No, because if that was the case, Awakening would be impossible, wouldn't it? Because we continue to fabricate thoughts. No, within the framework of the Eightfold Path, we simply get to the point where we recognize I fabricated all this and let go of it. You know, that, that's it. It's not, it's not, in that way, the metaphor falls apart, but most do anyway. It's not ultimately peeling every layer off. It's just recognizing that I've encapsulated myself in ignorance. You know? Thank you. Lorna, good morning. Good to see you. Great, yeah. Uh, just yesterday evening, I had a very calm mind when I was meditating, and when when it was kind of one of those out of the blue meditations where it really, your mind really did settle, it really did just focus on the breath, the in and out breathing of your body. Um, and the amount of relaxation that comes with that is, um, it, it, you just can't get that relax, well, I can't get that relaxation doing anything else yeah. in my life, I don't think. It, it, it really does relax the body and the mind. Yeah. It just sometimes it just gels and it's just wonderful. Yeah. And then last Saturday, uh, we had Matt's Qigong class and we were we took the class outside and went down by the river yeah. and had uh, the nice. Qigong class outside down by the river nice. and it, it was gorgeous absolutely gorgeous and talking about how what the Buddha's been talked uh, the about is being sensitive but when you're sensitive to yourself or you caught them in fabrications, you're not sensitive really to what right. is going on in the yeah. world. Your sensitivity is focused on yourself exactly. and taking it personally. Beautiful. Yeah. So, and I said this last week, this is a clear example of what this sort of says to me that we were doing Qigong down by the river outside and you just this whole movement and Matt's instructions and Matt's talk and all that sort of stuff that is put out. About halfway through the class, I started smelling, smelling with my nose. Um, because I was so caught up in my fabrications that I wasn't really enjoying everything, mm -hmm. everything that was out there. Yeah. I thought it was, I was doing everything, my arms are going at the right pace and mm. doing everything. But I was doing it with a with mind full of fabrications. Yeah. But with doing Qigong, um, eventually it does calm your mind and the fabrications lower, subside. Yeah. In the lower of, lowering of your fabrications, real life comes to light and in that case yeah. when I was doing Qigong it was smelling it, I could just smell the fragrances outside mm -hmm. this kind of like an earthy with that earthy smell of just being outside by the river blah 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 mm -hmm. and all that was just like not in my mind when we when we arrived there but it became obvious as we did the Qigong class and I, I, it was just like, to me, it was just a perfect example of what your suit of the sutta this morning is really about, that if you can get rid of your fabrications, there's so much more other stuff that we're just not 
in June to, to Costa Rica, and I just called to bring my father at the end. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. The, yeah, the other stuff is actually our life yeah. that we're missing because yeah. of fabrication. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's why I, you know, I've said it more. Qigong is, is just a great complement mm -hmm. to Dhamma practice because when you combine the two, it leads to that. And also, Matt is an outstanding mm -hmm. Qigong instructor because he, he comes from the point of view of the Dhamma, so he can introduce that for his understanding of it. So you, know, you all should try to come on the third Saturday, really. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's just such a great compliment. It's why, you know, Matt brings so much to our retreats, too, because he, you know, he, bring that, he brings the Qigong there. But thank you. It's wonderful. Anthony, good to see you. Good morning. Um, I couldn't, I guess because today's laundry day, I couldn't help thinking that uh, the person in the story needed a, fa a fabrication softener. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it, is it a John of practice just that? I, I get it. I'm going to use that. That is, that is great. Do you want a fabrication softener? <laughs> Go find the root of a tree and empty out and do John. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. I like uh, I am going to like description of the thoughts crossing over like clouds. Some, and sometimes they can do that. Sometimes the thoughts don't want to go away. And then, so, like, something that I sort of stumbled on is to just think to myself, can I be the space for this thought? And, mm. or, uh, or can I coexist with this thought? You see a lot of people have bumper stickers say coexist and I always wondered what that meant. And it actually helped me when I tried it because I, because it, because sometimes the thought gets stuck there. And so you just have to accept that and live and coexist with that thought. Mm. Yeah. And um, be at peace with the thought. Yeah. And sometimes think to myself that, if it's a very strong thought, thought that it might be in there for a long time, like it might, um, it might keep reverberating, and you just have to understand that at some point it'll stop reverberating. Yeah, yeah. As long as, long as you maintain the practice, keep coming back to the breath. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning. Yeah, <clears throat> this sort of, uh, makes me have to take another look at. All the, all the fabrications that, that keep coming up. Uh, and they've been coming up for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's life. Keep sitting there. Thank you. Yeah, isn't it marvelous, though, that we've come across a rather easy to implement method mm -hmm. to finally live our lives? Yeah, I mean, that's remarkable. The instruction to, you know, what's the state of your mind and be at peace with your mind. Yeah. That's the most useful thing that, that I have at the moment. <laughs> the fourth foundation of mindfulness. Keep me from exploding my skull. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's it really is tragic that oftentimes that fourth foundation of mindfulness is presented in a way that it's it's completely speculative. It's it's in one of these not physical realms, and it's not useful, and it's not what the Buddha taught. You know, just to be mindful, to achieve that state. It's being at peace with whatever's occurring. That's the fourth foundation of mindfulness. You hear me say often, oh, be at peace with a less than peaceful mind. It means that even though you are in the moment, engage with something that is less than pleasant. You don't have to react to it. You can maintain a calm and peaceful mind in the midst of anything. And, and that yeah. is truly remarkable. Yeah. The fabrication, is, the, the main fabrication that I'm, I'm realizing is that I still have the fabrication that I should stop my thoughts. Mm. That there should, yeah. no, that should not be any thought. And mm. that's been yeah. found into me over the last 40 that's, years of so-called yeah. spiritual practice. That's, that's the most hurtful yeah. teaching on meditation because you can't do it. Why would you want to? Yeah. Frustration. It's, it's the ultimate frustration. You're trying to do something that you, that you just can't do. Can't do. Why would you want to? I used to say that it, that the only way to do that is to cut off your head, and I don't recommend it as, <laughs> as a dhamma <laughs> A little too severe. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, <laughs> uh, but meditation is that, that's the common thinking that meditation is about developing a trance like state. And I, I, I could, in five minutes, I could have you all in a trance. Why and I, I would you know I might get a little recognition about that. Why would I want to do that? It's a quick way to lose your audience. It's, yeah, and it's it's just a magic trick. It's all it is, you know. It, it's just it's just 
it's not sleight of hand, it's sleight of mind. Mm -hmm. And it, again, concentration is what the Buddha taught. Thank you. Jen, I, you know, you really belonged earlier in the, in the class, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I went across the front row. How was I? Like, what? <laughs> I think you're clean today. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, a couple different things. Um, the idea that you need to stop thinking in order to be peaceful and calm and anxiety free is something that is that actually that fabrication because I see it in so many people yeah. is actually a, an agitating thing for me like when I when I hear people you know I see somebody suffering and then I I hear them say oh I, I can't you know I can't meditate because I, I can't I can't call my mom. I can't stop thinking. You know. Um, also, is the same reaction that I have when I when I listen to the sutta, which was just like an initial agitation about with the question of, no, oh, no, 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 no. You're you're confused. Your your questions are confusing you. No, 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 no. <laughs> you don't don't think about what's going to happen when you. You're already out of your, yeah, you know, and that's, that's right. And that's um, interesting for me to see that about myself. That that's that kind of reaction. Yeah. That's my reaction. My agitation is that, that needs to be different. Do you see? And because there's there's because it's something you've done. You. You sure. identify with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. And so kind of just um, like Anthony said, allowing for that space for that kind of agitation, just kind of recognizing it and, and letting it sort of arise and pass away so that I, my mind can clear and I can actually respond, you know, in a more helpful way probably like is something I feel like I'm, that's the space that I'm in right now. Yeah. Well, and that, you, again, you're talking about practicing the Dhamma at the point of contact. Right. That's, that's how we do it. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it can't be applied any other way. You yeah. know, the, the, the Dhamma, the Eightfold Path is fabricated because it's fabricated to meet us where we are in a fabricated mind but and ultimately the abandoning of all fabrications and then we what what's left is a mind that is resting in right view unwavering right view we simply see things as they are without the need for them to be any different it's a calm and peaceful mind and it was it lorna was talking about the, the the peace the relaxation that comes from concentration that's the ultimate relaxation isn't it because it's it's both physical and mental we found a way to calm our minds and not just through, and I'm, exercise is a great way to relieve stress. I'm not uh, against it, but it's also used in a way that's not addressing the underlying cause of ignorance. So we should exercise and we should meditate. <laughs> so keep all my bases covered. Kevin, good to see you. Um, I just really cherish all the wisdom that you amazing it makes my head real in a way <laughs> and i mean r-e-e-l yeah <laughs> well maybe the other way too <laughs> so and yeah i really think you know one of the key lines in the whole sutta is that is that we recognize the rising and passing away of all phenomena yeah. and that these fabrications are just part of the phenomena the thoughts are part of these phenomena Yeah. sense them in our mind and our body. Yeah. And I think we can just cherish those moments when we are meditating, when we do a thing. One of the levels of dana is are just touching that. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Kevin. Um, 
what a wonderful class. You know, that, that uh, uh, we're going to spend a couple more weeks, a couple more classes, I think, on jhana, one or two more suttas, and then we're going to get into the, the summer series on the three marks of existence. Uh, and I think that will prove to be very enlightening. I think that's it. But uh, we'll finish with, uh, with meta as we always do. The Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, content and easily satisfied. Unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state, let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and un unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Peace. Thank you, Thank you Mary and Mary for joining. Have a wonderful day. Um, could Ram, Lorna and Jen stay for just a few minutes? Thank you, John. See ya. Say hello to David, please. <laughs>